Hello! We're going to prove Rolle's theorem today. Rolle's theorem, the proof of Rolle's theorem, was touched upon a little bit in class. We kind of just drew pictures and decided it made sense. So we're just going to go one more step, add a little bit of communication, uh, just a little bit more symbols, and we'll have a nice proof for Rolle's theorem. Now, if you're watching this, and you haven't seen the video for the proof of Fermat's theorem because you want to see this one first, that's fine, but I would just like to recommend maybe you should see the proof of Fermat's theorem first. I feel like it just flows better that way. In any case, uh, this is a statement of Rolle's theorem. Let f be a function such that the following three conditions hold. Firstly, that f is continuous on a closed interval a, b. Secondly, that f is differentiable on that open interval a, b. And finally, third, that f at a equals f at b. This almost looks like the mean value theorem, except one of these conditions isn't there for the mean value theorem. See if you can guess which one. Cool, and I'm not telling you. Then, there is uh, a number c in this open interval such that f prime at c is equal to zero. And that's why I said maybe check Fermat's theorem because it, it's reminiscent of the result of Fermat's theorem. And in fact, we will need Fermat's theorem to prove Rolle's theorem. So that's why I thought the order made sense. So without further ado, let's prove this together. There are three cases. That's how the proof starts. To prove, there are three cases. The first case is that on this interval you're dealing with a constant function. It's kind of easy. We'll work our way to more complex things later. So the first case is that f of x is some constant k. Then, if you're going to take the derivative of f on this interval, you're always going to get zero. So then, we would say that f prime at x Hmm, you know what, I'll use a c. It doesn't matter what you use, but I'll use a c. f prime at c is equal to zero for any c in this interval where the function is differentiable. So if we're trying to show that there exists a c in this interval such that this is true, well, it's true for all the c's in this interval, so certainly this holds. So that's the proof for the first case. So you're, you're done, check mark or whatever. But the second and the third case are a little more complicated, but also the second and the third case are so alike that for the third case, you can just say similarly to the second case. So really, we're about to do the hardest part in the middle. Ready? Okay, let's get rid of the Rolle's theorem statement. And so what could the second case be then? How would you write it? I feel that the way that I would think about it intuitively is not the way that the proof goes, but the proof is laid out well in the way that the textbook gives it. So we're going to do that. So we're going to say the second case is going to be that the function f of x is strictly greater than f at a, which is that first endpoint for some x in the open interval a b we're always working in the open interval because we're trying to find c in the open interval so hopefully that'll help you keep your memory straight as to not close brackets here right so i'm just gonna maybe put a picture so here is x equals a right and then here's x equals b and f at a equals f at b, but f at x is greater than f at a for some x in here. So it's kind of like this is a point on your curve if it's just so happened that the value was here, zero. Then you end up getting some kind of, kind of looks like it arcs up and then comes back down. Or maybe it's really complicated, but this is the most simple sketch I can think of as to why it is that we're setting it up like this. f at x is greater than f at a for some x in a, b, plus it's continuous and smooth, it's gonna end up looking something like it's gonna have a little hill, basically. Okay, so that's the picture of the situation here. If you need to draw that picture on an exam, that's cool too. So we have 
to then argue that there's going to be a maximum value somewhere here. Obviously it's intuitive, but that's not what proofs need. They need a lot of rigor and support maybe from other theorems. And we're going to employ the extreme value theorem. So then the extreme value theorem or EVT for short is the one that says if you have a continuous function on a closed interval, then you are guaranteed to have an absolute max or an absolute min, but in this case, it looks like it's going to be a max. Okay, so then the extreme value theorem or EVT gives that F has a max value, maximum value on this closed interval. And the reason we can't say it's on the open interval is because the extreme value theorem means it's the closed interval and a continuous function. So you start out by doing that, and then the way that you move to getting to concentrate in here is you do this. All right, so since f at a is equal to f at b, as in the picture, so the picture can really help here, since f at a is equal to f at b, and f at x is greater than f at a for some x in here, right, for some x in our open interval, then the max value is going to have to be in here. So this is a logical argument now that, yes, the EVT gave us that there's a max value somewhere in the closed interval, but because we have a situation that looks like this picture, if you translate it algebraically, f at x is greater than f at a for some x in here. So we have to have, um, the max has to exist in here. And it's going to look like a part of a hill because we have continuity and smoothness. Just pausing there for you to think about that. This is a great theorem to go through the proof and just understand properties, continuity, differentiability, what that means, how that works. I think it would be really good for preparation for the final anyway. So in any case, we have this here. So therefore, okay, so since this is true, the, the maximum value is a local max at a c in the open interval a b that's kind of what i just said when i was pointing to the picture after i wrote here okay so we concluded that that's the case and now we're at this point where okay so we know there's a max value right but really we don't want to show there's a max value we want to show that there is a c somewhere in here such that f prime at c is equal to zero. How do we jump from information that there's a local max in here to saying that c prime at c, c prime, f prime at c is equal to zero, f prime at c is equal to zero? Well, you can very easily because I told you go watch Fermat's theorem and this gives you f prime at c is equal to zero by Fermat's theorem. So we don't have enough room to write Fermat's theorem, so we'll just write by Fermat, which is fine. So we can appeal to Fermat's theorem and the extreme value theorem in order to give us what we need for rules. And this is this case where you have some kind of picture that sort of looks like this. In any case, this was the hardest part of the proof. So if you can understand this logic, you're good. And then you can go on to step three, which is kind of the opposite of this one and appeal to similar reasoning. So let's do that. Yeah, almost done. And now if you want to work ahead while I'm doing this, that's great, or just skip ahead. It's nice though to take advantage of the fact that you're going to be able to see it in a second, so you might as well try to challenge yourself and see what's going on. So this was this picture. We're going to need another picture. If you can hear that beeping, it means my laundry is done. Okay, so part three, as I said, very similar to part two, but kind of the opposite. 
This is saying that there is f of x, a value of f, less than f at a for some x in the open interval, for some x in kb. So you covered the constant case in case one, and you covered the fact that there was this hill in case two, and now we're just looking at a picture. So let's say I just have, for simplicity, the, this is the x-axis, and then I have x equals a, and then I have x equals b, then what's happening to my curve is that there's some x in here where the value of f of x is less than f at a, and so because you have continuity in a nice smooth function, it's going to do something like, I don't know, it might go like this, but for me, I really like to just use that kind of little valley drawing that helps me understand it better. So you have something like this, or more complicated, but at least this has to happen because f at a and f at b are the same, so it's going to have to come back up at some point. It's smooth, continuous, it's going to make a valley. So the exact same, but somehow opposite argument is going to work for this case. So all you have to do is say, by similar reasoning to case two, F has a local minimum value at some c in the open interval. You don't have to state the EVT that gave you that there was going to be an absolute max or min, and then you don't have to state that logic that in fact it has to be in here because of how this is all set up and how f at a equals f at b. You just have to say this. So there's a local min. And if there is a local min and the derivative exists, then by Fermat's theorem once again, we have that f prime at c is equal to zero. Again, by Fermat, I'll say. But if you don't say that, that's not too bad. Uh, you wouldn't lose points for not repeating that it's Fermat's theorem that gives this, because it is very similar reasoning. I just felt like it. So therefore, these three cases have exhausted all the cases you could have with a differentiable function on this closed interval or open interval rather, that's continuous on the closed interval where f at a is equal to f at b. Obviously the pictures are very simplistic. Check the textbook, page 287, because there is a nice bunch of pictures that outline it and they're prettier than mine. So try that, but this concludes the proof. So now you have seen the squeeze theorem proof and you've seen Fermat's theorem proof and you've seen Rolls, which uses extreme values theorem and Fermat. So just keep working on them. And I'm sure in an hour or two, you'll be really, really close to having all three of them as if you have them memorized.